как смягчить воздействие западных санкций, говорил сегодня Михаил Мишустин. На встрече со своим белорусским коллегой российский премьер подчеркнул, надо усилить сотрудничество в рамках союзного государства. А на совещании в правительстве обсуждали, как сохранить доступность лигарницей. It's Tuesday, March 15, 2022, and welcome back to Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution broadcast examining social, economic, uh, political, and geopolitical concerns in this time of international strife. I'm Bill Whalen. I'm a Hoover Distinguished Policy Fellow. I'll be your moderator today. Uh, proud to be in the company of three of the smartest people I know, the, the Goodfellows, as we jokingly refer to them. That would include the historian Neil Ferguson, the economist John Cochran, and the geostrategist Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, the Hoover Institution Senior Fellows all. So, gentlemen, as we are two days shy of the three-week anniversary of Russia rolling to Ukraine, let's continue our conversation about the ramifications of that act. We're going to do something a little different today. We asked our viewers to send in questions related to Ukraine and Russia, and they uh, did not disappoint. We received questions from over two dozen countries representing five continents around the globe. Uh, you might be curious that we received absolutely zero questions about COVID. It was predominantly all about Russia and Ukraine, so let's stick to that today. With our first question, it comes from a general named Igor, who lives in Ukraine. He lives in a town just outside of Kiev. And he wrote the following to us, quote, had we had something similar to the Iron Dome, we could have avoided a lot of casualties as well as panic among the civilians that flee to the western part of the country. Is there an option of helping Ukraine setting up something similar to the Iron Dome? If no, is it worth pursuing? HR, why don't you take that? It's absolutely worth worth, worth pursuing. And, and I think what really is missing in this debate about MiGs or not MiGs, you know, this is, these are the fighter aircraft that, that po the Poland has pledged for Ukraine is really the overall purpose, which is to ensure that Russia can't use the, the, the air domain uh, with impunity to commit mass murder against civilians, right? So, so I think medium range air defense capabilities is, is one way to do that. Iron Dome is one of those systems. There's also a very good French and Italian system that could be provided to, to the Ukrainians. And then of course, uh, as, as, the, as this very informed and on the ground uh, viewer uh, mentioned, uh, short of ship capabilities, which are be very important, I think, to challenge Russia's efforts to make the Black Sea a Russian lake, and in particular to, to mass forces for an assault on, on Odessa. Mm -hmm. Neil? Well, it's worth noting that uh, Israel hasn't been uh, unambiguously supportive uh, of Ukraine. Uh, it's part of a strangely non-aligned uh, Middle East. Uh, you'll perhaps have noticed uh, how little support uh, there has been from Arab states too. And that doesn't surprise uh, anyone who's following the diplomatic uh, game here because the Biden administration was struggling, scrambling to resurrect the Iran nuclear deal in the desperate hope that Iranian oil would reach the market and head off uh, yet another inflationary wave. Uh, this did not please uh, Israel. It did not please Saudi Arabia or the Emiratis. So I think that is an important part of the answer to the question. But I want to say, uh, first of all, uh, my heart goes out uh, to you, uh, your friends and family Igor, who are struggling against this horrendous uh, Russian assault on your country, this cynical, uh, downright, downright evil attempt to stamp out Ukraine's hopes of uh, independence and a Western orientation. And it is agonizing uh, to watch the horrendous atrocities being committed against Ukrainian cities and Ukrainian people, including people living in the outskirts of Kyiv like you. We failed to equip Ukraine to defend itself. Arms sales to Ukraine from the West plunged after 2018. Uh, there's some responsibility here for uh, this uh, on the shoulders of uh, Donald Trump, but the Biden administration made matters worse uh, last year. It was an, an extraordinarily reckless thing to promise uh, Ukraine NATO membership and, and not to really mean it, uh, as gradually the Ukrainians have realized, and then uh, to fail to equip them to defend themselves. As, of course, in the past, we equipped Israel to defend itself. Israel didn't conjure up its extraordinary defenses all by itself. It's enjoyed decades of support from the United States. Yes, Ukraine needed an armed dome. Yes, it needed significantly more air defenses. It didn't receive them. And that is, uh, I think, going to be an enduring source of shame uh, for the United States and its allies as this war unfolds in the way that I fear it's going to unfold. Mm -hmm. John? So let me add... Um this is something HR said very wisely uh, when we were talking about the uh, no-fly zone last week. Hey, you can uh, stop people from flying from the ground as well as from the air. 
Uh, so certainly air defenses, robust air defenses would have been a great idea. Um, and now uh, Russia seems to be moving to this, uh, uh, they're using missiles to uh, attack ground targets. Well, where do those missiles get fired from? And can you shoot them down in the air? Those would be wonderful capabilities. The question was why we didn't do this, along with why we didn't provide Ukraine a whole bunch more ability to defend themselves. And I think the answer is clear. Um, there's this, and it's continually uh, invoked now. People were worried, oh, we don't want to provoke Putin. We don't want World War III to break out. <clears throat> and I think this is, from everything I've read, this is simply a mantra that is repeated. The idea that uh, Putin could do anything more <laughs> if we were to provoke him, he seems to be doing absolutely everything he thinks that uh, he can do right now. So sort of the model of Putin's behavior, uh, oh, he's kind of a sleeping dog, but if we provoke him, he would do something worse, is an interesting model and, and not one I think bears out on, on having given Ukraine more defensive ability early on. And, you know, <clears throat> provoke World War III, what are we talking about? This isn't the Soviet Union. Uh, I, I think, I hope this question will come back. Exactly what is it that we are afraid uh, Russia might actually do? But those that's the reason. And uh, I think it was a, a pretty empty reason. Okay, we received a letter from Ali in Iran who wrote the following quote, as someone who has lived his entire life under Islamic theocracy, I deeply value freedom. Despite the state's pro-Russian propaganda, maybe Iran many Iranians sympathize with the Ukrainians. I've always wondered why the West appeases dictators both in Moscow and Tehran so much. We don't expect American troops to come and free us, but is it too much to ask not to finance them? Is it these regimes affected propaganda and lobby in the West, economic interest, realpolitik, or are they just spineless and are afraid to escalate even when tanks are rolling on their border? Neil? Well, first of all, it's brave of you uh, to write in those terms, uh, Ali, and we uh, salute your bravery and hope that it doesn't have any adverse consequences for you. Free speech is something that we enjoy here on this show and in the United States, but of course, we understand how dangerous it is. Uh, a friend of mine spent a long period of time in, uh, in an Iranian uh, jail uh, for uh, saying the wrong thing. Uh, my own view of uh, Islamic theocracy is uh, based uh, heavily on my wife, Ayan Hirsi Ali's experiences uh, in uh, Islamic uh, countries and thinking and writing about the problem uh, of Islam and its, its relationship to a fundamentally undemocratic, illiberal politics. I think the United States is gradually learning, but too slowly, the limits of sanctions as a weapon. Uh, we thought wrongly that sanctions would deter Putin from invading Ukraine. They didn't. We've used sanctions against Iran recurrently since 1979, uh, at the time of the, the hostage crisis in Tehran. And you'll have noticed that uh, Iran is still uh, an Islamic Republic uh, run by Ayatollahs. Uh, and so I think at some point we need to ask ourselves uh, what exactly we expect of sanctions and, and when will we recognize their limitations? I'll make one final point. My own view at the time of the Iran nuclear deal when it was first uh, being uh, constructed was that it was a mistake, uh, that it would simply give Iran breathing space. Uh, and the economic resources uh, to continue to prepare its premeditated campaign to acquire nuclear weapons. Uh, and I'm afraid that uh, with every passing year, uh, we get a little closer uh, to an Iran that is not only engaged in all kinds of nefarious activities in the region, but is actually nuclear uh, armed. Uh, and when this happens, we'll look back and say what a tremendous failure US policy towards Iran was. Uh, just at the moment when it seemed as if we had a credible anti-Iranian alliance that stretched from Saudi Arabia to Israel, really amazing uh, achievement when you think back to what to, led to the Abraham Accords, the Biden administration came along and said, nope, we're going back to the Iran nuclear deal. It now looks as if that endeavor has in fact failed, uh, that the Iran deal isn't going to be resuscitated because guess who sabotaged it? That's right, the Russians. Uh, I'm not sure whether to think this is a good or bad outcome, but my broad sense is that it's inconsequential because Iran is on the road to being a nuclear power and we don't have an answer and nor for that matter do the Israelis. HR? 
Yeah, I would just say that I think we've been supplicating to the Iranians because it fits a pattern that we've engaged in really since the revolution. And I remember, you know, Zbigniew Brzezinski you know, going to Algeria to meet the foreign minister of the, the new Islamic Republic of Iran, thinking that there would be some kind of conciliation. You know what the answer was? The answer was U.S. hostages and a, and a hostage crisis. Then after that, you know, we we had multiple attempts at, at conciliation, uh, not not retaliating. You know, after the 1983 devastated devastating bombings of our embassy and the, and the Marine barracks. Why didn't we do that? Because we thought, well, maybe they'll be open to some sort of reconciliation. Maybe we can sell arms under the Reagan administration uh, as, as a sign of our, our goodwill toward the end of the Iran-Iraq war, uh, when, when, when Iran was was reeling from that war. But I could, I could go on and on after Cobar Towers, after they, they, you know, they their proxies killed 600 Americans in, in Iraq. Every administration except the Trump administration labored under this delusion that we could change the Islamic Republic by welcoming their theocratic dictatorship into normal relations uh, with, with, you know, with the world. Well, it doesn't work. All that does is give them more resources to strengthen their grip on power internally and to fund their four decade long proxy war against their Arab neighbors, uh, Israel, uh, the United States, UK, the, the, the West broadly. And, and so I, I think our policy has to be with Iran. Don't let them have it both ways, right? Don't don't let them, uh, you know, get the benefits from integrated integrating themselves into the into the global economy while they continue this four decade long proxy war and pursue uh, the most destructive weapons on earth. So I, I think that I think the only alternative with, with Iran is maximum pressure uh, and 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 a support right for, for Iranians who who want to get out from under this this uh, theocratic dictatorship. It's not the normal state for Iran to be in, which is a country with extraordinarily rich culture and and uh, an affinity for for the arts and 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 a uh, empathy, you know, for for the world. Uh, this is an artificial situation and I think stability in Iran is a myth, you know, and and uh, we ought to do everything we can uh, to isolate that regime until there's a fundamental shift in, in the nature of the government, such that it ceases its permanent hostility uh, to its neighbors, Israel the, and the United States. And I'm the one who's really mad about this. <clears throat> First of all, let me also thank Ali for writing and the tremendous courage it takes and how important it is for Americans to hear that uh, people like you, there's lots of people like you in uh, Iran and what a wonderful country it could be. Um, the utter fecklessness of this policy is astounding. Uh, we are now, the, the administration is still on its climate war, <laughs> which is the war is to shut down fossil fuel development in the United States before alternatives are, are at scale. Uh, yet we are <clears throat> turning to Iran and Venezuela and telling them, oh, your sanctions are off if you'll just goose the gas prices and get us through the election. And then we can go back to shutting down climate. <clears throat> Meanwhile, over the weekend, China announced a vast number of new coal-fired plants that they're going to put in so much for the climate. Um, what this does, think of what this does. Uh, what do sanctions mean? Sanctions mean you're a terrible bad person until we decide that we want your help for somebody else. So Putin's watching and he knows just how long we're gonna keep up sanctions because uh, the minute, you know, we were really mad at Venezuela and, and Iran and so we needed their help. So Putin knows, uh, Putin's learned from this. Okay, you're gonna threaten a lot of sanctions. And the minute you need gas prices to be a little bit low, I can count on those changing. You know, if you get in trouble with China or something of the sort. And the other message is sends loud and clear to Iran. Oh, by the way, um, <clears throat> we're not uh, even talking about Iran's adventurism, support for terrorism, its, it's conventional uh, troublemaking in, in its region. Um, we're just about nukes. And the message is loud and clear now get nukes as fast as you can. Uh, you know, back to the point what, what are we worried about, Vladimir Putin? Oh, he has nukes. So if he wants to run an, inv an invasion, uh, we can't even stop him invading a third country because he might have nukes. Hmm, are the Iranians smart enough to figure out uh, how does America work? Oh, if we just set off one test nuke somewhere and say we have nukes, now we can do whatever we want because America won't touch us because we have nukes. So it, it's just a disaster on three, uh, on three dimensions and, and, and utter fecklessness by the administration. We received a, a question from Miguel in China who wrote the following quote, do you think China agreed to permit the invasion of Ukraine in exchange for its support of its own invasion of Taiwan? How likely do you think that an amphibious invasion is within the two, next two years? Do you think that President Xi will use the invasion as a rationale to expand his mandate in October? I would say yes to all. 
<laughs> and I think it's really important to to hang Ukraine around the neck of China to to not allow them to to continue to have it both ways to profess that they they really want a de-escalation of the conflict and you know, all the you know calling on all parties language. It doesn't take a heck of a lot to read between the lines in the joint statement released before the Olympics or in the in the statement or the readout that was that was issued 24 hours before the invasion of the phone call between right. Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin. So they they've professed their love for each other, and I think we need to to make sure they're they're, they're viewed together on the world stage. And so what's important is to help Taiwan get all the capabilities we've talked about in connection with Ukraine as quickly as possible in a way that that uh, that that I think um, Neil already alluded to, similar to the the airlift to Israel in 1973. I do think that the chances of China you know, trying everything short of, of an invasion uh, in, in the next year is 100 uh, percent. And then and then the chances of a cross straight military action of some kind, a blockade, an effort to take over the the, the airspace, interrupt communications. You know, I, I think the chances of, of something like that happening uh, in the next two years is quite high, and I would put maybe like 80%. But we can change that, right? If we work together to provide the kind of defensive capabilities uh, that Taiwan needs to, to defend itself. And so, uh, I, I mean, I think you're, this, this, uh, you know, th- this question alludes to really that uh, what we have to do now, which is, I think, do everything we can to win Cold War II, which we know has already been made clear to everyone because of a hot war in, in Ukraine. And this competition is fundamentally with the two authoritarian revisionist powers on the Eurasian landmass, uh, Russia and China. Mm-hmm. Let's get John and then we'll go to Neil, because Neil, I want to uh, follow up the direct question to you from a viewer. John? Okay. <clears throat> yes. Uh, the answer to the question uh, I'm not the geostrategist here, but I I see the same uh, reasons why uh, China will be provoked sooner rather than later. Um, China, of course, has a big decision now. Whose side are you on? And the natural temptation will be to quietly send things to Russia and keep them going. Um, China's, as we've pointed out on previous shows, but even more so now, it's in a temporary moment of weakness. And that's exactly when this kind of foreign adventurism is, is more likely to break out. Uh, their economy is in deep trouble. Um, the, the number of empty apartment buildings, high-speed trains to nowhere, debts that can't be paid off, uh, local governments running out of ability to pay things is becoming evident. Uh, COVID is now breaking out in China, which is going to make things even worse for them. Uh, so, and, and we're busy. So there's the classic window of opportunity. I agree with HR. Uh, they're most likely going to be tempted to encirclement, to blockade, uh, as a prelude to direct invasion. It, it seems like the West sort of gets mad with direct invasion. Mm-hmm. Remember, the sanction, sanctions are, do can work with Russia. Now, where they work is that Russia's economy is very simple. Uh, they pump gas and they buy stuff from abroad. <laughs> so uh, the, the point of sanctions against Russia is to stop them from importing everything from computer chips to tractor parts that they need to get their economy go- keep their economy going. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we can do that, um, then that is actually quite effective on, on Russia. That will not work with China. Our integration with China is just the world's integration with China is much, much deeper than you sell us oil, we sell you tractor parts. Hey, John, just a quick question though. Hey, but isn't it time to to really reduce our vulnerability in connection with the dependence on China? I mean, you know, Xi Jinping wants the dual circulation economy. I mean, I and I know I know this cuts against all your instincts, but isn't it time to really start decoupling a little bit on our own terms with China? Uh, that's uh, to some extent, but I don't think it's possible to decouple uh, within the Taiwan framework for, uh, within 10, 15 years. Uh, now, some some of decoupling, you know, don't don't try to build stuff in Michigan. It's not going to work. Just frankly, it's not going to work. But yeah, you know, you can build stuff in Vietnam and 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 other places where it's uh, where manufacturing actually works these days. And that's we'll have that longer discussion. But decoupling is is not going to be a strategy that is going to stop the China invasion in the next five years. You, you just can't can't do that in five years. It's just just um, you know to echo your previous point though, we are in uh, World War. We're in Cold War. We're not yet World War Three. We're in Cold War um, in the Second Cold War. And the question is, when does the West stop and fight? Uh, in, uh, people don't. People think of Russia as the old Soviet Union. It's not. It's the it's the GDP of Italy and and the military spending of France. Uh, this is quite different from the Soviet Union. And at some point, uh, <clears throat> when will we stop and do something about it? We have awesome capabilities. When will we stop and do something about it? Is the open question. And and uh, you know, 
there's another window of opportunity. Right now, uh, if I were Xi Jinping, I would say, mm, they're not gonna do anything about it. Uh, but maybe a year or two, I, I notice the drums beginning to roll. People are getting madder and madder about it. They're realizing if you don't fight in Ukraine, you fight in Poland. And, and uh, that's another closing window of opportunity. So on to Neil for yeah, Neil, wisdom yeah. on that. Yeah, let me read this question to you. Then let's get, let's get the big picture on China. You, you truly are the international man of history. You have a fan in Papua New Guinea. Uh, Johnny in Papua New Guinea writes, greetings from the highlands of PNG. My question is for Neil. I've heard him mentioned a couple of times that he doesn't think the Taiwanese would put up the sort of resistance that we're seeing from the Ukrainians were China to invade. Not having been to either country, I'm wondering why he thinks this. Don't the Taiwanese have the same pride in their independence? They have compulsory military training, don't they? Well, great to hear from Papua New Guinea and uh, uh, a country I, I one day hope to visit. I have visited Ukraine and Taiwan, and uh, they're very different places indeed, uh, with very different histories. I knew uh, that the Ukrainians would fight and fight tenaciously uh, against this invasion. I had Ukrainian friends who said, we'll be like the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. I also knew that they were equipped at least to fight the kind of war they've fought uh, using stingers and javelins uh, to great effect, inflicting extraordinarily impressive uh, casualties on Russian forces. HR, it's true, I think, to say that the Russians have lost as many men in just over two weeks as the US lost in the entirety of its uh, presence in Iraq, which uh, is a staggering fact. I, I think uh, the, the simple reality is that Taiwan is, is unprepared uh, for this kind of war. Uh, and HR already alluded to that. Uh, the Taiwanese military uh, is not really uh, set up to be a porcupine, whereas Ukraine has turned out to be much more of a porcupine than Putin expected. Moreover, my Taiwanese friends tell me uh, the pol politics of the Taiwanese army uh, uh, are not really that uh, well aligned uh, with the politics of the country as a whole. Over time, people in Taiwan have been more and more attracted to a Taiwanese identity that is distinct from China's. Even if they're not all committed to the idea of outright uh, independence, in practice, younger Taiwanese uh, enjoy the fact that de facto their country is independent and is a fully functioning democracy. By the way, it's a much more successful economic uh, democracy than, than Ukraine, which has struggled uh, to rid itself of endemic corruption and the dominance of oligarchs. The trouble is that the Taiwanese military uh, is, in, if anything, aligned towards the opposition Guomindang and far less committed, I think, uh, to the notion of, of fighting to preserve Taiwan's de facto autonomy. So I'm somewhat pessimistic about how things would go if the Chinese were able to pull off a successful Invasion. That's a big if, of course, because as HR will confirm, uh, the Chinese have very little experience of actual combat. Amphibious landings are very difficult. Watch out, because the Russians are about to try one in Odessa, it seems. So my sense is that there's a dramatic contrast between these two places. Taiwan is a dynamic, cutting-edge economy. It is the, the capital of uh, high-end semiconductor production. Uh, Ukraine's economy has struggled through the years of independence since 1991. On the other hand, the Ukrainians are fighting for their independence in ways that George Washington would take his hat off to, whereas I strongly suspect that if the Taiwanese saw a successful Chinese invasion, resistance would not be especially uh, sustained, because I don't think that the Taiwanese army is ready to fight the kind of fight the Ukrainians are currently fighting. Can I, can I add a economist perspective, there's a big difference here. Uh, Russia is the GDP the size of Italy. China's GDP is almost the size of us. Uh, Russia spends $60 billion a year on defense. China spends 350. Uh, we still spend uh, 800 billion, but uh, you know that's, that's closer to us. Uh, Ukraine is contiguous to Poland and NATO. You can get stingers there. How are you gonna get stinger weapons into Taiwan? <laughs> you gotta bring them on a ship and that ship is gonna come under missiles 
going to be, it's much, much harder for the U.S., for anybody to try to supply Taiwan. Uh, the rest of the world is, is going to be, uh, t- China is much more self-reliant. So sanctions are going to have much less effect on their ability to run their own economy. And we are much more dependent on China, So uh, as is the rest of the world. So cutting off China is going to be much, much harder. And even politically, the U.S., you know, we, we have this, we, our official policy is we recognize there's one China and we sort of, so <clears throat> on what basis do we go in and really fight about, uh, about ending it? And as, as HR will soon remind us, there's there's a lot of question about how effective are our are, are, are our ships effective fighting platforms or are they sitting ducks for Chinese missiles? Um, so just what what we could do about it is is much harder in Taiwan than not in Ukraine. Uh, HR, a question to you from Joe in California. He writes, quote, since the beginning of the invasion of Ukraine, we have been subjected to endless photo streams of destroyed or abandoned Russian tanks. With the proliferation of cheap anti-tank and semi-autonomous suicide drone weapon systems over the last 30 years, are we witnessing the decline of the tank as a strategically effective weapon? I would say, you know, no weapon is strategically effective, right? So but I think that, you know, the, the tank will be with us, you know, for the foreseeable future because you need mobile protected firepower as part of what we call combined arms and joint operations. I think you know, close combat, uh, maneuver warfare, and, and, the, and the ability to integrate all arms into the fight defend, depends on your ability to integrate really infantry fires, artillery fires and rocket fires and, and, uh, and, and air delivered fires uh, and mobile protected firepower. And what the Russians have shown is that they're in, unable to do that. They don't, they're not well-trained enough uh, to, to be able to integrate all arms into the fight. The other aspect that the Russians have been missing, which is, I think, uh, you know, hard to understand, is they're not conducting effective reconnaissance operations. Reconnaissance operations are designed to make contact with the enemy with your smallest possible element, to report completely and accurately about the situation so that you can integrate all arms into the fight and make contact, especially with the defending enemy who has the advantage of, of hiding from you. So you can make, you can make uh, contact on your own terms, under favorable conditions. And so these are the deficiencies I think you're seeing. There's no capability that will ever be decisive. I mean, drones now are a new development that are quite capable. But we did, we're catching up, right, with anti-drone defenses that are that are, that are include uh, include electronic warfare capabilities, as well as some directed energy weapons that are that are now being fielded. So, you know, war is a continuous interaction of opposites, as Clausewitz said, which means those continuous interaction in war and then also between conflicts. And and there's never been a silver bullet, right? You've always had, you know, the submarine. Than the sonar, the bomber, the radar, the tank, the anti-tank weapon, uh, but it, it really is the integration of all arms that make you effective. And the Russians haven't demonstrated the ability to do that. So what they, what's their answer? Their answer is, hey, just rely on fires and rubble cities and commit mass murder against uh, against civilians. And sadly, that's what we're seeing that Ukrainian people have to endure. Okay, on that note, that's another question for you, HR, and let's get the group's thoughts on this. This comes from Chris in Singapore, who writes, quote, if the Russians use chemical weapons on a population center to blunt insurgency or hasten a capitulation or a tactical nuke on supply lines in the west of Ukraine, does that change the NATO calculus on military intervention? I think it absolutely will. Uh, and, and you know, this is, you know, I, I had the privilege of serving in the, in the White House in, in April of 2017 when uh, the, 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 when the, the Assad regime, I, I'm sure, with the complete approval and support uh, of the Russians, committed mass murder at Khan Shikun. Uh, and the reason they did that is because there, there was a, you know, an, an important uh, you know, insurgent uh, group, anti-Assad group that was holding on to critical uh, urban terrain. And, uh, and, and what they did is they, they decided they would break that defensive capability uh, by using some of the most heinous weapons on earth, in this case, a, a nerve agent. They murdered over a thousand people, including over 500 children in that strike. Uh, and it was after that that President Trump decided uh, to, to strike against the airfield and the assets uh, that, that conducted that, that attack uh, as a way to restore deterrence. And the use of these weapons, again, had not been used really for 100 years mm-hmm. since 1919. So I do think it will change the calculus. And, and I think this is one of the reasons why we on the show have kept it keeps saying, hey, stop taking things off the table, right? Stop talking about things you're not going to do and at least create some sort of a dilemma for Putin where he has a sense of ambiguity about what a response might be. Mm-hmm. Neil, John. 
I think it's a bluff by Putin because of the military response he would get from the US. Because as HR has said, the Biden administration keeps signaling that it doesn't want to get into a war with Russia. I don't know why President Biden felt the need to tweet that over the weekend. It certainly isn't the kind of uh, signal that we should be sending. The signal we should be sending is there's a distinct risk uh, of escalation if you carry on uh, in this vein. Because whether you call a weapon a weapon of mass destruction or not, we're seeing mass destruction right now in Kharkiv and Mariupol, where the death toll is probably at the 10,000 level. The problem for Putin is not really that the US might escalate. He knows that we won't. We won't even lend Polish jets to the Ukrainians. We're so scared of what Putin might do. In that sense, he's really got the psychological upper hand. But he knows that the Europeans are quite close to the bitter pill of the oil embargo. And it will be a bitter pill economically for Europe if they stop buying uh, Russian oil. But I think if he goes to chemical weapons, uh, let's leave aside the notion he might use a tactical nuclear weapon, then I think there's a distinct possibility that the German government would no longer be able to say we can't do this because I think popular opinion would demand uh, that they go to the next level. And that is, I think, why this is a bluff by Putin. He's already grinding out this victory through siege warfare, bombarding cities into submission. He is likely, uh, according to my uh, understanding, uh, to see victory over Ukrainian forces in the east of the country, uh, where there is uh, a really uh, uncovered conflict happening. And it's quite likely that Ukrainian positions near Donbass will crumble in the next week or two. He's making gains in the south, as I mentioned already. Uh, Odessa faces uh, the real prospect of the naval amphibious assault. And slowly the Russians are encircling Kyiv. The war is, in fact, going his way. Contrary to the images that we're seeing uh, of, of Ukrainian success on social media, and on cable news, the reality is that the Russians are grinding out a brutal victory. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and for that reason, I don't think he needs actually chemical, uh, much less nuclear weapons. But to talk about them is to establish again and again the weakness of the administration in Washington. Uh, it, he, he could achieve quite a lot just by using these threats without necessarily meaning to carry them out. Mm -hmm. I want to say the same thing in, in different words. Uh, let's face the fact chemical weapons and, and to some extent tactical nuclear weapons are largely symbolic. Um, whether you die from a building collapsing on you or pieces of, of hot, fast flying steel going through your body or chemicals or nuclear, you're just, just as dead and it's just as horrific. Uh, but they carry an enormous uh, psychological weight. It's hard, doubly horrible thing to do to people. Uh, and that's uh, that's why that's why he's threatening them, because how many times have we said we don't want to provoke Vladimir Putin to do exactly that? Oh, he says, great. That's what I'll threaten to do. Uh, but it also is uh, he understands, I think, the same provocation. So what would provoke us and what would provoke Europe uh, to take this uh, to, re to really start fighting here? Well, that's exactly it. Uh, um, we are. Uh, Europe is motivated a lot by seeing a humanitarian catastrophe. Now, in pure military, move the, check, the chessboard pieces around. Uh, our objective ought to be keep the Ukrainian government alive and uh, make sure that Russia loses this war in the sense that Ukraine emerges from it an intact country. And that, that should be, you know, we're, we're willing to fight to what it takes to get that to happen. That's not the reality. Uh, the reality is that uh, U.S. and European public opinion is swayed very much um, by uh, an appropriate concern for humanitarian disaster. Uh, and I think Putin knows that if he were to create a, a, a worse humanitarian disaster, a symbolic humanitarian disaster of chemical or nuclear weapons, that would be the thing that would tip the, the, the tanks to start rolling in from Poland and actually fight, uh, fight, you know, realize this is now a war that Europe cares about and will actually firsthand fight, not just supply the Ukraine. So I, I agree with Neil, it's a bluff and, and perhaps one uh, at some danger called sooner rather than later. Now, of course, the other part of, of game theory here, uh, of mutualist or destruction, is it's useful to try to convince the other side that you're a little bit irrational and might do something that is uh, totally crazy. And the only way to convince someone that you might be totally crazy is to be a little bit totally crazy. So it's not an easy bluff to call. 
John, let's stick with you. An economics question from Mike in Singapore. He asked, quote, what are the consequences to the broader economy worldwide when oil prices hit $200 per barrel? Maybe instead of when he should have said if, because I just looked at uh, oil prices right now. This is Tuesday the 15th. Brent crude fell under $100 for the first time in March. But John, if oil were to hit $200 a barrel, what happens? Uh, well, that's bad for the world economy. Uh, that's a big supply shock. Now, fortunately, um, it's not as bad as you think. There's a good recent study saying even that if uh, uh, ben Mall, I recognize one of the authors, I won't remember the other authors now, uh, even Germany turning off, uh, turning off Russian oil would only cost it about 3% of GDP. Um, so it, it would be hard. It would hit uh, uh, people's well, livelihoods hard. Uh, but um, energy is one of those things that you know, when the price goes up, you can substitute out of uh, fairly easily, um, you know, you know, relatively easily. So I think the economies, if left alone to their own devices, could, could uh, go along much better than they did, for example, in the 1970s. Now, the, other, the problem is that high oil prices provoke politicians to all sorts of crazy ideas. Uh, there was an idea floated in the UK, uh, Neil will tell us if it actually happened, that the proper response to inflation and oil prices was for the government to print money and give it to people so that they can uh, spend more money on, on oil prices, on, on buying gas. Uh, adding fuel to the inflationary uh, fire. Uh, our Federal Reserve in the 1970s responded to oil price hikes by pumping up the money supply and making inflation even worse. Of course, our government uh, responded with price controls and, and already the, the magic words price controls are floating all over the, the left-wing uh, part of the internet, excess profits, taxes for oil companies. So oil price hikes, they are they're, they're not necessarily economically salient. Oil prices are now in real terms, uh, you know, no higher than they were in, in many previous periods. But uh, sharp oil price hikes certainly provoke a very economically damaging shoot yourself in the foot uh, kinds of policies. And I think that's, that's a danger. Can I add something? Please. In fact, if one looks back at the 1970s, uh, the first real uh, inflation impulse from commodities was from food prices. And, uh, and food prices are being driven up uh, uh, just as much as energy prices by the war in Ukraine, because Ukraine and Russia are really extraordinarily important exporters of food. Uh, so I think John's absolutely right that we are uh, in an inflation crisis that is getting worse because of this conflict, uh, that it does recall the 1970s. Uh, but it's not just about oil. Uh, it's about a generalized shock uh, in commodities that extends to to food, uh, given the importance of uh, of Russia and Ukraine uh, to the global agricultural market, let me just add. And that. how about how about nickel? <laughs> Not to mention all those things that the Russians uh, have a dominant position uh, in producing and exporting, like nickel, titanium I, too. I think the food is is uh, something I just became aware of last week. So Ukraine. Uh, provides a lot of food and provides a lot of food to Europe. Uh, it is the planting season in Ukraine and things are not getting planted. Uh, so this is gonna cause a big problem. And it is now, finally, Euro Europe is not only rethinking its disastrous energy policies, it's also rethinking its disastrous agricultural policies that maybe going all organic wasn't such a good idea uh, as well as maybe getting rid of all of our uh, nuclear and other uh, and, and natural gas supplies wasn't such a great idea. Neil, let's stick with you. Let's talk about U.S.-Saudi relations for a moment. Uh, we have a question from Omar in London who writes, quote, Saudi Arabia refuses to increase its oil production whilst Israel jostles for the role of intermediary between Russia and Ukraine. In a lot of these developments, it appears that the heating up of the new Cold War in Europe is accelerating the weakening of American power in the Middle East. Would the good fellows agree with this analysis? P.S. I'm a great admirer of Professor Ferguson's work and enjoyed meeting him briefly at Oxford Sheldonian last year for his lecture on the Anglosphere. Thanks for the autograph, sir. Well, good to reconnect uh, with you uh, through the, the technology of, of Zoom, Omar. Listen, I think uh, things took a turn for the worse uh, since you wrote, uh, because today the Saudis announced that they would be quite open to pricing uh, oil in Chinese renminbi. Uh, this is uh, the, just the latest uh, slap in the face administered uh, by Mohammed bin Salman uh, to Joe Biden, uh, and I think you see here uh, payback for uh, the way the Saudis feel they have been uh, ill-used uh, by the United States. Now, you might well say uh, that Mohammed bin Salman deserved to be ill-used, uh, given the way uh, that he appears implicated in 
uh, in the murder of uh, the journalist Khashoggi, but uh, leaving that issue to one side, the strategic importance of Saudi Arabia, uh, particularly in a world where the US has decided not to develop its own energy resources, uh, is not trivial. And the Biden administration's decision to throw aside the successful strategy of its predecessor, which was to forge an anti-Iranian alliance between the Arab states and Israel. This was the strategy that evolved into the Abraham Accords. Ditching this in a doomed attempt to resuscitate the Iran nuclear deal was a dreadful mistake, the consequences of which I think uh, we've already alluded to. But one very obvious consequence is that uh, hitherto reliable US allies in the region, Saudi Arabia and Israel, are effectively non-aligned in this current crisis involving the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So this is the way in which strategic failure plays out. Uh, one short-sighted decision, hey, let's not really arm the Ukrainians seriously and not really mean it about NATO, begets another strategic failure, which is, hey, we can resuscitate the Iran deal and get some oil on the market and bring the price down. Oh dear, we've just alienated the, uh, the, Arab and, and, and the Arabs and the Israelis. I could go on because I think the cascade of strategic error has some way to run, but I think that probably answers your question. Mm -hmm. Let me chime in from an economic point of view. What is it, 1973 and we're begging the Saudis to turn on the taps again? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we not only, one of the other things we threw away, America had a remarkable run. We were energy independent. We became an energy exporter. Why? Fracking. Fracking, not uh, nobody's energy policy was fracking. It was basically over the dead body of uh, all of American federal energy policy. But we had, and we had the greatest reduction of carbon emissions of any advanced country because we moved to fracking and natural gas. Energy independence with one uh, low low energy prices, which was uh, starving all of the people we don't like around the country, uh, and and, uh, and we just we we have we are throwing that away. We have been throwing that away. Uh, the first thing Biden did when he came in office was cancel the Keystone Pipeline, <laughs> and that 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 brought oil and, and, gr and green lighted a Russian pipeline. Green lighted a Russian pipeline, canceled the Keystone Pipeline, which brought oil from Canada to refineries. That now the only other source of that kind of oil is Russia. Why are we buying Russian oil? Because we canceled the Keystone Pipeline that would have produced the same oil. Even let's and let's be nice to green energy. Uh, the uh, National Environmental, uh, uh, whatever the name of the act is, is uh, what's stopping. We can't build transmission lines to bring hydropower uh, down to uh, down to New York. Why? Because it's all stuck in court, like everything else in the United States. That had been reformed. They turned that reform around too. So it, it's uh, our, our energy pot. We we now have basically financial sanctions on our own oil and gas industry. It's very hard to do to get any money. Uh, to invest in oil and gas. Why? Because banks are looking around at the Fed and knowing who's going to be in charge of the Fed soon and saying, uh, 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 we're not going to lend you money. So we, we have completely destroyed that wonderful energy independence, which, which not so much as an economic issue, but as a political and military issue. So now that we are hat in hand begging to the Venezuelans and the Saudi Arabians to turn on the pipeline, there's another one of your big strategic mistakes, Neil. And we're still at it. Uh, from what I'm reading about uh, energy policy and the financial energy policy, the SEC is still all in on mandating ESG dis disclosures. The White House just had a big announcement today on how we're all still all in for turning off fossil fuels before alternatives are ready in practice. We're still at it. And if I just might bookend these strategic fa failures, I, of course, again, I think it's, this, this is all rooted in a perception of weakness, irresoluteness. Uh, that, that is tied to the to the humiliating surrender and withdrawal from Afghanistan, which I don't think there's any other way to put it. And then and then what we're seeing most recently is not only supplication to the Iranians, but supplication to the Maduro regime in Venezuela, uh, in in really an effort uh, that I think will dilute the president's professed desire to compete with authoritarian regimes by promoting democratic principles and institutions. I think it all comes together in Venezuela. We forget about this. I, I interviewed Leopoldo Lopez uh, for the Battlegrounds podcast last week. He's a phenomenal person, endured seven years in prison under Maduro and escaped uh, in, in an amazing tale of how he, how he got out. But, but you, know, he, you know, he makes the point, hey, these, these regimes are connected to each other. And Maduro survives in large measure because of support from China, Russia, and Iran. So we tend to try to disconnect these dots 
but they're actually very well connected to one another. This is my axis of ill will, a phrase that I hope we can uh, use more often. Just like <laughs> we, we just resuscitated Mike Gallagher's sanctions on ourselves, John. Uh, due acknowledgement to our guest of last week, who uh, I think gave us that idea. Okay, well put. Let me pose two Russian questions to you. Uh, first, Neil, one uh, sent directly to you from Tiago, who uh, resides in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. He writes, Neil, why is Russia never turning into a quote-unquote Western country? Where did the West fail in that regard? Was the Clinton-Yeltsin bromance our best opportunity? Well, I wish we had Steve Kotkin on to answer that question. Our colleague is one of the leading authorities on Russian history in the world today, and uh, we're looking forward to having him on the show at some point in the not-too-distant future. Let me channel my inner Kotkin. If you want to get the real thing, he did an excellent interview with uh, Peter Robinson recently, which I highly recommend, even better than the one he did for The New Yorker, by the way. The truth is that Russia has had periods uh, of wishing to westernize, followed by periods of di 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 simply turning away uh, from the West. Uh, you can see this, for example, in the, the 19th century. Alexander II emancipates the serfs, uh, thinks of a whole series of other reforms that he can do to make Russia more like a European country. Uh, then uh, when he's assassinated by revolutionaries, uh, his successor Alexander III turns in the opposite direction and pursues a policy of pretty much reaction. Uh, you can see it in Russian literature too, which uh, I remember as an undergraduate gave me the key to understanding Russia's history. I remember reading Turgenev and Dostoevsky, and that's really the, the kind of yin and yang. I hate to mix my cultures uh, in that metaphor, but they are the kind of opposing uh, poles of, of uh, Russia's literary uh, history, debating whether Russia should be uh, Western or simply is destined to be uh, Oriental. When you look at the map of the world, I encourage my kids to do this. We look at the globe and marvel at the sheer size of Russia. That it extends so far across the Eurasian landmass that so much of it isn't Europe at all. And I think the Kotkin argument is that, that because of its extraordinary geography and because of a history in which the, the role of despotic rulers has been uh, decisive, it's very difficult to transform Russia into a European country, even when the man at the top wants to do it. The man at the top would say, this would be Putin's argument, I tried in the early years of my time as president to get on with you guys, uh, but in his narrative, we simply wouldn't uh, accept the terms. And now he's, of course, turned in, in very much classic Russian style to a, a really reactionary, anti-Western, anti-liberal, anti-democratic ideology. I'd go even further and say that we actually are dealing now with Russian fascism. Uh, this is not a, a, a Kotkin line, this is a Ferguson line. Uh, R Russia was this country that never really got to try fascism, unlike almost all the European countries. Uh, and now it's, it's ended up with its own brand of, of fascism because fascism was for so long forbidden fruit, if you like, in uh, the Soviet Union. I remember going uh, to the Soviet Union before its collapse and being puzzled that, that people were selling cassettes of SS Nazi marching songs in the streets of what was still Leningrad. I remember thinking this was bizarre, but as, uh, as a Russian friend explained, this was cultural forbidden fruit. So the, the upshot is that we now deal with a, a fascist Russia that overtly rejects Western norms. Putin's made that quite explicit. And at some point when all of this ends in catastrophe, as it will, fascism does, there'll be no doubt another attempt to turn in the other direction and, and regain Russia's European heritage. Maybe there'll never really be a resolution of this tension between the East and the West in Russian history. So Neil's been referring to Stephen Kotkin, who is a colleague of ours here at Hoover. He's a senior fellow. I'm happy to report he will be a guest on Goodfellows in June. Uh, John and HR, your thoughts? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that you know, Stephen Kotkin's, read, read Stephen Kotkin, and then also read George Kennan's Russia in the West, which is which it really expounds on the on the theme that Neil just summarized, and and uh, and and in terms of the you know the historical forces that pull Russia away away from Europe, uh, although periodically there's a desire uh, to 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 rejoin Europe. Mm -hmm. John, so I want to disagree. Uh, I don't think there's a historical determinism that says Russia or China have to be meekly authoritarian in in, in some way or another. 
I think Russia is, is culturally uh, uh, close to the West. There are most people in the country would love to live in a liberal democracy and the people in charge know that if that would happen, they would lose their wealth and at this point, mostly their lives and they're not gonna let it, uh, let it happen. Uh, the, you said the man at the top might want it. The whole problem is liberal democracy doesn't start from a man at the top. Um, so I, I think uh, Russia is, is just in the classic trap of a country that um, most people would like to liberalize and live Western values. Uh, but the people in charge uh, know that they will not be in charge if that happens and that they are very happy extracting what they can, which is a kind of trap that exists in many countries. Ideology follows from that. Ideology is invented to justify power. Nobody in Russia believes their ideology. They, they, they're, they're, they've had a hundred years now of, of parroting what they're supposed to say. I think Neil's very perceptive and, and I've had the same thought. It is essentially fascist, uh, not communist. It's nationalist, it's cronyist, it, it has almost an ethnic view of, uh, of, of the, the greater Russian people and their, their place in history. Heck, we're, we're looking at Liebensraum right, right now. Uh, but but uh, Neil called it- I would say, I would say no. religious too, John. Religious too, yes, yes, thank his you. Capture, his, his, the way he's captured the Russian Orthodox Church and used it uh, as a- it, it's, it's not fascist Russia, it's fascist Putin. Now, where's our, the question was our fault. Um, and I wanna remind us of some history and, and correct me if I'm wrong guys, but in the early 1990s, that we were passing along, much in the US is passing along Russian propaganda that, oh, there was this brief period and then NATO encircled them and, and was trying to go after Russia. No, what was happening in the 1990s is, is the whole plan was Russia was going to join the liberal democratic world. Uh, NATO, in fact, the plan was NATO would include Russia. Once Russia looked all, sort of like Poland, great, welcome to NATO, you're, you're welcome to the community of, of normal countries. That was the plan. And to say otherwise is, is absolutely rewriting it. Now, where'd the plan go wrong? We were unbelievably naive in Russia as we were in Iraq. Uh, and it's funny that Americans seem to not have taken a civics lesson in about 50 years because uh, liberal democracy is not just about sweep out the old water, have an election, done. There's a whole range of civil society, rule of law institutions that go under keeping our democracy safe. Uh, it's something that we forget in the US. It's not just about elections and 50 to 51 to 49 and we shove it down your throats. It's about rights of minorities, civil society institutions. And I think that Naivet is, is in part where it went wrong, uh, but it's not just, you know, we're not the only agents here. Things went wrong inside Russia as well as from what we did to Russia. Uh, they, they had their own country to run. Okay, rebuttal from the historians. I got the history right. Ah, you stumped the historians. I was, I well, you know, Stephen Cockin makes this point uh, oftentimes, John. I just want to highlight one of your points you made. It's really important. You know, he says that, you know, that there is this narrative, you know, this kind of so-called realist, which is really an ideological narrative in which we cause all the problems in the world, uh, that because of NATO enlargement, you know, we just made Putin so, you know, mad and fearful that like, he didn't have any anything else to do, any other course of action, but to be this aggressive. Kotkin makes a very persuasive point that think about how, how much worse it could be if NATO hadn't enlarged. What would, what would the plight be of the, of the Baltic states, of Poland? Uh, you know, if, if NATO hadn't enlarged. And our rule of we don't fight unless it's in NATO, uh, exactly. And uh, Putin had to find other op option, become liberal democratic and join NATO. <laughs> I, I guess I uh, would love to believe uh, that the world was as John describes it and that uh, Russians and, and, and Chinese people were just itching to embrace uh, democracy and, and liberal norms. The problem is that there just isn't a tremendous amount of evidence to support that. Uh, of course, one can't really trust polling uh, in an authoritarian regime, uh, but such polls as we have indicate that Putin's popularity has actually risen since the invasion. Uh, if you look at Chinese sentiment, uh, the Chinese are tremendously uh, supportive of the direction that Xi Jinping has led their country in. Uh, the people who tend to have uh, your viewpoint, John, are actually a relatively small educated elite uh, who we tend to exaggerate uh, the importance of because of the kind of people that, that we meet. Mm -hmm. uh, I have Russian friends and I have Chinese friends who have strongly liberal inclinations, even if they're somewhat pessimistic about the prospects of their countries getting to democracy, but they're people like us. Uh, 
I mean, I think one has to spend time in these countries to get a sense of how profoundly different they are historically and culturally uh, from the countries where we grew up. I'll just tell you a story, brief anecdote. I was in Kursk, uh, which was the scene of the greatest tank battle in history in World War II. It's not far from the Ukrainian border. And uh, we were filming their television series about World War II. And as we as we wandered through the fairly dilapidated uh, tower blocks uh, on the outskirts of course, we came across a few boys playing a desultory game of soccer. And, and in this sort of bleak landscape that made the childhood, my, my, uh, the Glasgow of my childhood seem positively a paradise, I asked, I asked these boys, why, why do you stay here? Why, why do your families stay here as there seem very little in the way of economic opportunities? And they replied, because we're patriots. That was their answer. But let, let me agree a with different you. Different mindset, John. It's well, a very different mindset. Different mindset. Now, let me agree with you. Uh, there's an important point here, which is propaganda works. Control of the information space works. Um, people can, you know, people can be, uh, their minds can be molded. This is a point not lost on our internet companies, on our, our media controlling a narrative, uh, on all the troubles we have now, on, on our universities that are, hotbeds of indoctrination. Uh, and and I, I don't want to appear naive that you can, uh, a country can fall, a system that's been in place 70 years can fall apart. And then the next morning, everyone says, great, we've been reading our Milton Friedman and our, and, and our Locke and we want uh, liberal democracy. No, uh, it's a process that takes a while. But I think um, uh, eventually once information leaks in, once you get a chance to debate, where is this country going, uh, you know, 10, 10 or 15 years of open debate later, uh, I think that's where people, and, and understanding what's going on in the rest of the world, I think that's where you would end up, but not. I'm, I'm, I'm not a cultural determinist. You, you can see Russians who live in the Baltic states or, or in Ukraine who yes. genuinely wanted to make democracy work and don't side with Putin. And of course, if you go to Taiwan, you can see Chinese people making democracy work exceedingly well. So this isn't an argument for cultural determinism, more an argument for why it's proved so difficult yeah. over the centuries. But you know, so I, would say, hey, I would say also, we have to point out, just to be fair to, to so many Russians who have been calling you know, for, for change and, and an end to this kleptocratic you know, dictatorship in, in Russia, that there are more political prisoners in Russia today than there were at the height of the Soviet Union, right? That there are more people in, in Putin's internal security services than there are in the in the in the Russian military, so that's not a sign of strength, I don't think. And totalitarians and authoritarian regimes, they look strong until the very moment when they collapse. And I remember, you know, when I was a exchange student in high school to Romania at the height of Ceausescu's rule, it looked like he he, he would always be in power. And of course, that changed quite dramatically. And I'm not trying to suggest a, a complete cultural and historical parallel between. Romanians and Russians and so forth, because much different historical experiences, especially in the 20th century. But I, I do think that we don't want to discount the potential, I think, for the Russian people demanding a, a fundamental change uh, based on, I think, the, 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 what is going to be an apparent failure uh, by, by Putin. And then also, uh, you know, the, the economic consequences. As the Ukrainians who lived the same 70 years under communism are now saying, yeah, European Union looks pretty good. We have just a couple of minutes left. I want to slip in this last question before we go. It's a very poignant question from a viewer, George in North Carolina, who writes the following. This gets to the question of America's involvement beyond arming other nations and building porcupines around the world. Here's what George uh, wrote to us, quote, I'm a retired Marine and the father of a paratrooper currently somewhere in Poland who was previously deployed three times to Afghanistan and once to Iraq. Every country in which I or either I or my son have previously enforced or defended the interests of the U.S. is not currently safe for an American to be in. I hear noble words from General McMaster about supporting the people of Ukraine. I heard the same words about the people of Somalia, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Why do we spend our blood and treasure when our pattern is to eventually leave them in chaos and probably worse than when we were in. HR, why don't you take that first? Well, I don't think the South Koreans would would agree with, uh, with the viewer. I don't think the Bosnian Muslims would agree with that with that that viewer. Uh, so I would just say that, you know, I, of course, the, the, what you're alluding to is a, is a failure of either strategy, right? Because in a democracy to sustain efforts that entail, especially killing in the prospect of death and, and, and sacrifice, the American people need to understand, you know, what is at stake 
and what is a strategy that will deliver a favorable outcome uh, at an acceptable cost. And I think what you're alluding to are, are failures to sustain the political will to see through the, those efforts. And uh, and but I, I would say that the, the the record is much better uh, than the one that you you portrayed with those selective examples. Mm -hmm. John, I, I would just emphasize. So he has a point. The U.S. doesn't have a, a history of seeing through long run, somewhat painful commitments and then giving up at the last moment. The Ukraine is quite different. We are not invading a country to change its regime. We're, we're there to defend a country that has a perfectly good regime uh, on its own. Um, so uh, I, I, in, you know, if it settles into uh, Russia, gets half of it, and we're going to have sanctions for the next 15 years like we do with Iran, our, the chances of us, uh, of us uh, keeping going on it are pretty, are pretty slim. But it's a fundamentally different question uh, to, to do a regime change and then try to police and keep some other country going, as opposed to defend uh, a, a coherent country from invasion from, uh, from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Neil? I think it's very easy to allow the bad taste that the fall of Afghanistan has left in our, our mouths to lead us to think it's all been in vain and all futile. But the lesson of Cold War I was that containment worked uh, and containment kept uh, Stalin from going any further into Europe uh, than uh, the, uh, the, the frontier that became the Iron Curtain. Uh, as HR rightly said, we successfully defended uh, South Korea, uh, whereas uh, you can imagine a counterfactual in which we had let it fall. Uh, not everything turned out well. Vietnam did not, South Vietnam was lost. Uh, but then remember the things that, that were successful. Uh, remember Saddam's invasion of, of Kuwait uh, and how, uh, just as in the Korean case, the US assembled a coalition uh, and, and, and very successfully punished Saddam for that aggression and liberated Kuwait. So I, I can understand the feelings of bitterness that many servicemen feel at the moment because things did not turn out uh, well in Afghanistan and, and they did not turn out particularly well in Iraq either. But if we remember the record of the Cold War, the US successfully stood uh, for freedom in multiple countries. And that is why there still are US troops deployed in so many, many countries around the world today. And while Europeans may talk about achieving strategic autonomy and may now finally belatedly be doubling their defense budgets and meeting their native commitments. It will be many, many years before they are capable of defending themselves against Vladimir Putin's Russia without the help of the United States. Okay, I, let me just add, um, there's costs of inaction too. Remember Syria, Rwanda, Libya, for example. And, and I want to, I don't think that's right, Neil. Uh, uh, remember, Russia is not the Soviet Union. Uh, certainly in a conventional war against Russia, um, France alone might do it. We, we outspend NATO together, outspends Russia by about uh, 20 times as much uh, in, in defense expenditures. As a percent of GDP, it's low, but overall they're spending a lot of money. Uh, maybe HR, so take the nukes off the table, conventional war, does Russia stand a chance? Well, you know, you never want to underestimate an enemy, especially a ruthless enemy that has a lot of firepower and so forth. Uh, but, you know, no, they don't stand a chance. And I think the reason are, are, are those you mentioned in terms of defense budgets, but even more, I think, the, the, training quali and, the qualitative yeah. differences in the, in the forces. Yeah. I wouldn't I'm like to see the Europeans. Countries. I wouldn't like to see the Europeans in a fight against Russia without the United States. Yeah, no way. It, that, would not be, that would not be. Yeah, there have been years of complacency. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Let me slip in one quick question that we will go. It comes from a, a viewer, CM in the UK, who writes, quote, what can the West do to show strength in Ukraine that wouldn't result in a direct war with Russia? Could we drop aid, ammunition, and missiles over encircled Ukrainian cities? Could we take control of some parts of Ukraine that the Russians do not occupy yet? Given the planes, it's very simple. The planes, uh, as many planes as possible. Uh, there's no reason not to do that. Uh, there was a perfectly reasonable way of doing it with uh, the jets that the Poles were willing to make available. Much more significant uh, surface-to-air capabilities for anti-aircraft purposes to bolster Ukraine's defenses. And then the Europeans need to impose that oil embargo and really hurt the Russian economy where, where it's most vulnerable. John? Oh, uh, well, in some sense, we already are in a direct war. I mean, <laughs> send, sending weapons just because uh, you don't pull the trigger. Um, I disagree with that. I profoundly okay. disagree with that. This is not war. It is perfectly different, a completely different thing to supply a country 
and enable it to defend itself against uh, external aggression. And that is something the US has done in many countries around the world. Israel is probably the most famous example. But it is not the same as going to war. Very important distinction, John. Mustn't get that wrong. Well, um, it, we'll, we'll see. On the question of what provokes Putin or not, does he really care whether uh, we are pulling the trigger or someone else is pulling a trigger? Um, but I, you, uh, your, your point is well taken. Okay. Uh, HR, it's sort of the details matter here. Actually, it's not clear that the planes work because planes, I, I've learned this in the last couple of weeks too, planes too also operate in this combined, uh, you can't just go fly a plane. You go fly a plane, you're not coming back. Uh, you need a whole complex of electronics and, and suppression of anti-aircraft fire and combined arms and so forth. You need planes, you need training, you need electronics, you need, uh, you need coordinated um, uh, air defense uh, capabilities. So it's, it's not uh, quite so easy. But HR, what what... Can we in practice? Well, we, we have to think in terms of combinations of weapon systems and capabilities to accomplish certain tasks. Task one is to ensure that Russia can establish air superiority, maintain air superiority, uh, and continue to use the, the, the air domain with impunity to inflict casualties on civilians. The second thing is that we have to give the Ukrainians the ability to attack Russian artillery and rocket launchers in their position areas. And the third is we have to enhance their capability to interdict convoys because the continuation of this campaign relies in large measure on the Russian army's ability to, to resupply itself. So I think that, as well as I would say, some short of ship capabilities to protect Odessa and to challenge Russia's control of the areas adjacent to, to, uh, uh, to, to Ukraine and the Black Sea, so I think the way to do it is to think in terms of, of capabilities. And then, of course, associated all of this is, is assuring communications and having intelligence and surveillance capabilities and so forth. So I think, I think that's the way to think about it. And I think that's the way we are thinking about it. Uh, I hope we can get some of these enhanced capabilities to them quickly. So communications, intelligence, even advising, does this cross cross Neil's line into direct war? Those are certainly seems like very important things. I, when they're... Why are we not when there's when there's artillery things uh, shooting at cities for day on end? Why are those artillery uh, things not, not not being blown up when they're when missiles are getting launched? Why is the place where the missiles are launched from not instantly blown up? HR, that's an honest question. Well, I think once we take direct action uh, against well, Russian could, what, forces, why can't Ukraine do that? Yeah, well, they, they just need they need more capabilities th than they have. So I, I don't know what the stats are in terms of how much artillery they had at the beginning and how much is being has been you know, treated or or lost. Uh, but but I think you know what they've seen is some tremendous success. For example, with these Turkish drones, they need more of that kind of capability uh, so that they can attack these artillery systems uh, and and uh, and rocket launchers. And you know, of course, what they're doing quite well is destroying Russia's close combat forces when, when those combat forces try to close with their defensive positions. Now, I think you know they, they have an opportunity to interdict supply lines because there are some bypassed Ukrainian defenses in you know, Kharkiv. The defenders of Kharkiv are incredibly brave and resilient. So I, I think just getting them more capabilities to do what they've been doing in terms of interdiction uh, and then being able to attack the artillery systems and reduce their logistics capability. Gentlemen, we're going to cut off that point. I'd like to, again, thank all of our viewers for sending the questions. If we didn't get to yours, uh, my humblest apologies. It didn't mean it was a great question, just simply not enough time. But we'll be doing this again in a few weeks from now. So uh, do it again for us, OK? Uh, on behalf of my Hoover colleagues, Neil Ferguson, John Cochran, H.R. McMaster, all of us here at the Hoover Institution, I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this show and are interested in watching more content featuring H.R. McMaster, watch Battlegrounds, also available at hoover.org.